You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson on my show, Author to Author. And I'm here with Mary Ruth Hackett, who has written a very interesting book called Daughter by Design. How are you, Mary Ruth? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. I'm very glad. To. I think it's uh, exciting. So, um, I uh, I've looked through some of the material, and it, it's very interesting. So, it's a it's a unique style of book because it's not um, a straight psychology book, and it's not a straight faith based book. Mm-hmm. I kind of pull from my background in educational psychology and human development. Um, mm-hmm. That's what I have my PhD in. And so that's sort of my wheelhouse. But as a convert to the faith, I can't do anything <laughs> without having Christ as the center of it now. So he really yeah. sort of took over all of my scholarship. Good. <laughs> that's a good thing. Absolutely. Uh, me more. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so... Tell me what led you to write this book. Well, I I think we have time for the long story. The short story Mm -hmm. is usually just, I say, obedience to the Holy Spirit. And my spiritual director told me to write a book, so I wrote a book. But um, we do actually have time for the long story. So it's kind of fun to Mm -hmm. be able to share the full bit. Um, I, as I mentioned, my background is educational psychology and human development. So I... I converted about 15 years ago to the faith Mm -hmm. and, and did so after I had completed my PhD and had two little boys. Mm -hmm. I remember being pregnant and being in the the pretty gown, you know, not the normal gown that you get when you graduate, but the pretty velvet one with a funny looking hat. You Mm -hmm. look like you belong in a movie or in a courthouse or something. And I, um, I, I had people ask me, like, well, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? Because you've, you've spent so long studying psychology, and now you've got this degree. And I was fairly pregnant then. I was I was showing already, and I would just rub my belly and say, you know, I'm going to stay at home and raise my babies, and I'm going to become Catholic. Like, that was just, I was ready for it. Mm-hmm. And so I converted to the faith and started doing a lot of ministry-type stuff at our parish, Um mainly stuff with parenting because that's, that's what I knew. So I started a mom's group and then I started a women's studies group, um, started a rosary group for moms, things like that. Um, and I also started blogging and doing some writing and a friend of mine who was in my small group, we, we actually still have a small group together. Jenna Gizar started a group called blessed is she and asked me if I wanted to write for them. And I'd never really saw myself as a writer. And of course She showed me how wrong I was Mm -hmm. and um, she continued to encourage me to write. And that led to a podcast with the diocese of Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Our chaplain was the vicar of evangelization, father John Parks. And he and I got to know each other a bit. And he called me one night and said, would you ever consider doing a podcast with our diocese about parenting? I really think that this is something that's needed. Mm -hmm. So lo and behold, six months later, we had a name and I would show up to the recording studio and, and, and do my thing. And as I began that, I really felt it was important that if I was going to be in any sort of real ministerial role, that I had some good spiritual direction. Mm -hmm. And so I started working with another priest um, as a spiritual director. And in one of our sessions, we discussed the possibility of me writing a parenting book. And it had always been in the back of my mind that, yeah, I want to write a parenting book. And I was gathering all this content through my blog um, and through my podcast, Parenting Smarts. And, and so he said, I want you to write a parenting book, but not a normal parenting book. And I said, okay, well, wh- what do you have in mind? And he said, in order to be a good parent, you have to be a good person. Mm-hmm. And so we spent a lot of time talking about integrity um, and the integrity of the person and how foundational that was Mm -hmm. to to being a good parent. And so I started writing a a parenting book for moms, but a different kind of parenting book, pulling in the psychology um, a bit. And 
it really transformed um, away from being a book about parenting to being a book about growing in intimacy with the Lord and knowing who we are. Mm -hmm. And then COVID happened. Oh. And, you know, the world got flipped over and shooken up a little bit. And my world certainly did too. Sure. And I had finished my first, um, my, my first rev of the book was really solid draft. I'd been working with a publisher and everything was just put on hold. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be a beautiful thing for me and for this book mm -hmm. because I stepped away from the whole project and I just got back into prayer and got back into reading um, a lot of the spiritual works. Father Jean-Philippe is one of my favorite um, current writers and I just devoured his, his content. Uh, read a lot of uh, St. Teresa of Avila is my favorite saint. I got back in with her, started praying the rosary daily and I got more grounded myself. Mm -hmm. And at one point in prayer, when I was talking um, to God about this book, what am I supposed to do, Lord? What, what am I even supposed to do? Give me direction. I wrote this. What am I supposed to do? And he had me rewrite it. That was what I was supposed to do. And so I, I took it apart and dismantled it because it wasn't just for moms. It wasn't just for parents. The truths that he had given me in the book are for people. It's mm -hmm. for all of us. It's for college women. If college mm -hmm. women can understand that the primary embodiment of who they are lies in their everlasting role as God's beloved daughter, oh, wow, mm -hmm. they, yeah. they're going to be prepared for life. And if, if older women who've already gone through the child rearing and who, who, who are sitting in the quiet of their own homes every morning after the cup of coffee and just kind of saying, well, now what? If they can realize that, um, it really can be transformative. Mm -hmm. I, I, my scholarship was predominantly in the area of identity development. Mm -hmm. I did my master's, my undergraduate um, work was on some gender stuff in psychology. Um, this was in the 90s, guys. So before the gender politics, before all of that, I was actually looking at gender differences in um, boy and girl babies. Mm -hmm. in between four and six months for crit when critical periods of um, hormones kick in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had, I, but aside from that, most of the work that I did was um, my graduate work was all in the area of identity development, self-concept, um, self-esteem with kids, knowledge about child development and how that helps us to really um, have confidence as um, we become parents Mm -hmm. and uh, a lot about parental self-efficacy. Mm. And so identity and who we are and how we live that out at different points in our life has always been a passion of mine. It's, it's really something that um, has resonated deeply with, within me. And as a mom of four kids, I, I really want my kids to to have like such a clear understanding of their strengths, of their weaknesses, of, of the, the virtues that are present within them, that they can cultivate and grow through their struggles and the role that struggle plays in, in kind of honing who we are. And um, there's so much there. And it's, I feel a really neglected area of discussion. So I realized, okay, this is a book for everybody um, because before you can be the best parent, you have to be the best person. And um, I just rewrote the whole thing. And, and it was beautiful because it really was then complete. And I was able to really see, you know, God puts the brakes on projects sometimes and we mm -hmm. don't like it and it frustrates us, but he needed, he needed me to grow a little bit more to be able to see completely what he wanted for this mm -hmm. project. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the long story, Cynthia, of why I wrote the book. Beautiful story. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, when you think of the stories of why, you know, why I wrote this, which is what I hear at the beginning of every, um, of every interview, that's pretty unique. Yeah. 
Uh, in fact, that is absolutely unique. Well, so. I, I, I dare say everything about this book is unique. I mean, it, it's, it's broken into three sections. Mm-hmm. And the first section is about identity. And, and it's a little more of the psychology part of helping people to identify, again, their strengths, their weaknesses. Um, when are you most cha- When is your integrity most challenged? Things like that. To really get people to practice introspection and just take some time to stop and think about themselves and what they're doing in this world. Good and point. We just don't. We don't. And I think sometimes we think it's selfish, but you've got to know yourself. You really do have to know yourself if you, if you want any hope of living out what God has asked you to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've always thought that constant busyness we have that we refuse to give up is uh, not always, but at least partially a tool of Satan. Because it, it does keep us from other more important things. We're just busy, 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 busy. It is. It absolutely is. And one of the things that it prevents us from doing is just stopping and listening to the Lord. What mm-hmm. does he want of me right now? Mm-hmm. The second, the, the other, the other thing that I think sometimes we, we have a problem with in our culture right now, and that's what I devote the second section to is, is dealing with challenges. Mm-hmm. And we just want problems to go away. Yeah. We, no. we don't want to sit in any sort of suffering at all. Mm-hmm. But we need to. That's how we grow. We grow through these challenges. And, mm-hmm. and we don't just grow in our individual perseverance or, or, or those, those virtues. We grow in trust of the Lord. Mm-hmm. And that is so important. And we're not going to do that. We won't grow in trust of the Lord if, if we're never met with any struggles or challenges. And so that's kind of what I devote the second part of the book to is really understanding what are the crosses that we individually bear and, and, and looking to see how we can bear those with greater dignity um, mm-hmm. and with greater patience and with greater trust in the Lord. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the last part, which could have been the first part, but psychologist in me said, I got to get people hooked in <laughs> is, um, is the prayer part. And, you know, sprinkled throughout all three sections are reflection questions. So it's really good to do as like a mini retreat or a self-study or a small group book, but you can, mm-hmm. you can do it on your own. I, I told the, my printer, I wanted it small enough that I could fit into a handbag so that if someone's just at a soccer field or at a coffee shop, they can pull it out and just spend 15 minutes and do one little section and, and pray through one of reflection question. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a book that you read cover to cover. It's, mm-hmm. a that you, it's a book that you read and then you sit and you mm-hmm. take a prayer and you reflect and you journal. Uh, it, so it, it really is a different sort of book. But the last section on prayer helps you to understand what are your distractions? What are your priorities? Um, how can you individually create a plan to grow in intimacy with the Lord. So it's mm-hmm. extremely practical, extremely practical um, to help really, to help the individual to really transform. That, I mean, that's, that's what I want. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's, the book sounds um, well thought out, but it's so, I can see the tie into being a psychologist where you want people to succeed and to be happy. To grow. I do. I, do. I, 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 if you only give them facts and ideas and concepts, it's really easy to read a book and then data dump. So you mm-hmm. read it and you think, oh, that's cute. And you might highlight it. Or you read something and you think, oh, wow, that's really neat. I'll take that to prayer. And then the book goes back on the shelf. Or maybe you write it down in a journal. But it's really easy to just put it back on the shelf when you're done and Mm -hmm. think, was it entertaining or not? This is not designed to entertain. This is designed to have you go, ooh, ah, I don't know how I feel about that question. I mean, at one point I write in the book, do not move on to the next section until you answer this question. So I really put on my professor hat when (laughs) in writing this. Okay, I'd love to know what that question was. Oh, I don't, I don't remember, Cynthia. 
you just got people are just gonna have to buy the book and then they're gonna get to it and say oh that's the one Mary Ruth was talking about and there's some questions that almost sort of repeat themselves um because I really do believe in like sort of a, a, a Jerome Bruno would call it a spiral curriculum that kind of builds on itself. Um, mm -hmm. And so I do a little bit of that in this book too, where there's a question you're like, did I have that question? It seems like it's the same question phrased a little bit differently. No, but no, re-enter that question again and answer that again, because it's there for a reason. It's, it's intentionally put in there. So lots of questions in this book. So yeah, lots of questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, that's, um, that's helpful because in a way you're interacting with them just by asking those questions. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we are made for relationship. I mean, women are made for relationship. Um, men are too. I think women in a little different bit of a way. Yes. But all, all humans are called to that. We all are. Yes. We are, are all called um, for union and communion. Right. And and so, you know, when you said you're kind of interacting with them, yeah, I want to be on this journey. I want, I want, I share a lot of myself in this. Um, that was actually one of the things that changed from the first, the first writing to the second is I poured myself personally into it the second time with sharing stories. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those aha moments or some of those, ooh, Mary Ruth moments myself. Um, when I found myself particularly challenged or, or when I found myself coming to an understanding that I wasn't necessarily doing things right, or I was making excuses for, for things mm -hmm. um, but that, yeah, that second, that second revolution of the book, I did mm -hmm. pour myself into it and share with a lot of vulnerability, which actually mm -hmm. makes it really hard to put it out there and to hit the go button mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. sending it to a publisher. But yeah, we're called to do what we're called to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, fi I find interaction um, that is not obviously real face to face interaction. Very interesting. And you're actually the only the second person I've ever mentioned this with mm -hmm. in my whole life, which is 72 years. <laughs> But uh, I was studying for an MFA in writing at Albertus Magnus, and um, I realized that what I wanted to do was interact with what other people had written in memoirs similar to mine. Mm. And I mean, obviously, they weren't going to answer me. They were dead. It was a long time ago, you know. But um, just the idea that other people who could read what I wrote would be able to see something about an interaction in the past and possibly with those people who were going through the same sort of issues that I had gone through. Mm. And you're actually the only other person I think ever could understand that because people usually gave me a really weird look. Like, how do you interact? <laughs> you know? But uh, I think that's so important. Even if, you know, even if people don't get it right away, I think it does add something. It makes you think at a different level. It, you're absolutely right. It, it, I, it engages a different part of the brain. Yeah. It's not just yeah. a logical understanding of it. It's an emotional, relational, mm -hmm. um, human understanding mm -hmm. of what's happening. And, and that's how you affect the heart. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I do want to affect the heart. Mm -hmm. um, or I guess... I want to be a conduit for the Holy Spirit to affect the heart of others mm -hmm. because oh. it's needed. We need mm -hmm. that. Yeah, we do. We do. So that's, um, that's something that, uh, you know, could be brought into, you know, some kind of um, spiritual right us you know that you could could help people learn that yeah yeah mm -hmm. that 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 is true it's it's something that the ministry blessed is she that I still write for mm -hmm. um, really taught me to do to be vulnerable mm -hmm. in the writing because as one of the devotion writers you know we we read the scripture and then and then we share how it's how it resonates with us mm -hmm. that's extremely personal that's yes. 
extremely personal. Mm -hmm. We're not there to catechize or to talk about the theology or to, um, to write, to, to write a homily about it. We're there to say, what does this make us think of? How is the Lord speaking to me in this? And that's a very, um, very vulnerable thing to do, but it's needed. Mm -hmm. So I said, yes, to do it, (laughs) to Mm -hmm. doing it. Um, yeah, sometimes you have to say yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it is something similar to me. Um, you know, when I was starting to get ready to study for the MFA, um, I was driving down to work actually at Holy Apostles and I, I kind of was thinking, would I like to write, you know, Catholic fiction? Mm-hmm. I was like, should I write fiction? Should I write nonfiction? And I just, it was weird, I know, but I just got this message. I mean, I just, it was like, I didn't hear anything, but it's like it went through my mind. Write nonfiction. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, so I did end up doing that. And um my goal was to interact with people that I'll never meet, um, you know, through the book and uh, through the books, actually, and hopefully to have some impact on them, to make them think. Mm-hmm. Well, the books, the books last far beyond well, us. It, yes. They, mm-hmm. I mean, behind me, I have some just really, really old books. I love old books. So this notion of, of the, the books lasting, um, those words being there forever. Mm-hmm. I, I want my grandchildren and my great grandchildren, my great great grandchildren to read this book and to know my stories, but also to know that it was my desire for them mm-hmm. to have a deep and lasting relationship with the Lord as his daughter. Mm-hmm. And that's just a, it's just a very cool thing to be yep. able to communicate mm-hmm to those who are not yet born, who will be born <laughs> after I die to still yep. have that voice. Yes. I agree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now that said, I mean, my husband and my kids probably won't read this book. <laughs> probably won't read this book. <laughs> At least not until the, until my kids are older, but they did flip to the back to see the acknowledgement page to see that they were listed there. So good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yep. They've handled it. <laughs> yeah. There were a lot of late dinners. And um, sometimes I will admit there were times when, you know, they'd open the fridge and say, mom, mom, um, are you going to get milk at some point today? I mean, I have, I have, my boys are 16 and 19. So they mm-hmm. eat a lot. So even mm-hmm. if I think I've got enough food, I don't, I mean, there's, I just won't have enough food. So mm-hmm. there, there were in, in the, in the, the writing, uh, this last summer trying to meet the deadlines that self-imposed, of course, deadlines. There were times where I just shook my head. I was like, I don't know. Can someone figure it out? I, I don't know. <laughs> yep. Go to the store yourself, please. Here is money. Go get it. Go get whatever you want. <laughs> just let me finish this chapter. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. I understand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they, they were, they were all very, very, um, sweet and understanding and excited mm-hmm. about about all of this. When when I was asked to do the podcast, my my response to our priest was that I needed to think about it and I needed to talk to my family about it. Um, because with that vulnerability, when you have a family and when you're talking about parenting things like I do on Parenting Smarts, your your story is not only your story; it's their story as well. Yeah. And they all needed to understand, and they were old enough that they could understand at that point. Uh, although my youngest is 10 now, so she would have been five. Mm-hmm. So maybe not her, but everyone else was old enough to, under, to, un, to have a good understanding of what it meant for me to do this. And that mm-hmm. they, they might have, I would do my best to protect their privacy, but there might be times when I, you know, would say, yeah, it's really rough having a 14 year old or, you know, mm-hmm. whatever the story may be. They were great all mm-hmm. along. They still worry about us. We're great. Do this, mom, do this. It's wonderful. And mm-hmm. I, mean, I think they had seen me 
I'd been there with them all the way, you know, through to getting into to, um, grade school, um, you know, every day, mm-hmm. every day in and day out. Um, I was, I was the one. So it was just really beautiful them to say, do you want to do this mom? Then do it. it. Don't worry about us. We'll be great. Just do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Good. Yes. Mm-hmm. And to have, it's also kind of fun to have your kids be proud of you. I'm not, I'm not going to lie about that. It, it really is to see, especially my boys, because they're the older two, just be so proud of me is really cool. Um, Mm -hmm. It feels good. It feels really good. I see that as like a little kiss from the Lord too, that like, yeah, you're doing okay, Mary Ruth. You're doing okay. Whether I sell 10 copies or whether I sell, you know, a thousand copies or or 10,000 copies, whatever, it doesn't matter. I did what he asked me to do. It'll go to the people it's supposed to. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I grew so much in, in writing it also. Mm-hmm. Um, that even if no one read it, I, it was good to do. Mm-hmm. It's, always, yeah. it's always good to do things when God asks you to do them too. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is true, of course. But I think also that, um, you know, if you can have, you could have an influence on someone a hundred years from now who just is bored and picks up a book that's, that somehow they come across. You'll never know. You never know the effect you have. But that's such a beautiful thought is someone just picking up this old dusty book and brushing it off and opening it up and maybe seeing, seeing areas that their mom had journaled in a little bit, but then hadn't continued and her picking it up. I have in my mind, this whole, this whole movie story. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> this book. But, uh, but yeah, so I mean, books, you know, English isn't going to go away anytime soon <laughs> and uh, neither are books. So you never, you never know who will pick them up and what effect it will have on people. You know, so um I found that interesting when I was studying because, you know, we talk about different people's writings. Mm-hmm. They did the reaction of different people, you know, weren't all the same. Mm-hmm. And I would, you have, you know, a couple of paragraphs here that are talking about something and yet people are reacting to the same story differently. So, you know, the impact you have, you don't know. But it's also that it can impact different people very differently. That's true. That's that is that is very true. That and that's that's a beautiful thought too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's not just one reaction to it. Yeah, I was going for one reaction, but I <laughs> when I wrote, but I don't think it's gonna happen. <laughs> but you know. Well, uh, and, we, and, well and, we, and we don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. What we intend and what happens can be very different. Sure. But, um, but yeah, I've I've thought about that a lot, and I do think it's it's really it's a it's a dialogue that can occur okay. over stories. I mean, you know, when we read something that was written, you know, by one of the patristic fathers, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, how long have they been gone? And yet, there's still that. It's like a dialogue. Writing it is really, you know, when God invented writing, <laughs> it was a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was I was explaining to one of my daughters today about the writing process, and my it was my ten year old, and and I I t- we were we were talking about the the reasons why her father and I have high expectations for them academically, and why it's important to us that they get good grades Mm -hmm. and she has a little better command of than a lot of 10 year olds about it because she has a brother in college Mm -hmm. and and he earned a full tuition scholarship and it he he's all of her siblings are, are super smart and she's super smart too and so she was asking me about you know writing essays for example that was the example that she had given and and I said you know it's not just a matter of learning how to write a good exam, uh, a good essay in school so that you can then write a good college entrance essay, but that's important. That, that is important. That is one of those byproducts of, 
I said, but when you, when you learn how to write that relationship between language and thought Mm -hmm. is very intricate and language can help with your thinking, just the writing process. That's one reason why journaling is so effective in, Mm -hmm. in psychology, because as you're writing, it's forcing you to process emotions and ideas that you maybe hadn't put into words yet. Mm-hmm. And, and you're able to, to see nuances in your feelings and in your thoughts and to be able to write all that down and then put it in an organized fashion and then convey it to someone else. That takes a lot of practice and, and, and a lot of work. But then to think on the flip side of then a completely different person reading mm-hmm. that um, just adds a whole nother dynamic to it. But yes, I was, I was telling her, I said, no, you, you need, it's, we do want you to do well on mm-hmm. your essays and things because it tells us that you are learning how to think and you mm-hmm. are learning how to organize your thoughts. Um, mm-hmm. That for me is what is, is so beneficial about about writing and why I want my kids to be good writers, because if you're a good writer, chances are you're a pretty decent thinker also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Which doesn't necessarily mean you'll be a good speaker. (laughs) I know that's, that's, that's something that I, that I, uh, I'm, I'm learning to embrace the speaking aspect of now being an author. Um, and I'm enjoying it. I love it. Cause I feel like I'm back in the classroom mm-hmm. when, I give, when I give talks, but I, I, I think there are individuals who are excellent speakers who aren't necessarily good, good writers or who don't aspire to be good writers. They just, I, I've, I've got a good friend who does this, you know, she takes it to prayer and she jots down notes and then she is just on fire when she's in, in front of people speaking and preaching and spreading, spreading the gospel um, mm-hmm. in such a beautiful and powerful way. Um, but she wouldn't necessarily consider herself a, a writer first. She's more of a speaker. Mm-hmm. So I've got, I've got the flip side, but definitely well, a writer first. Yeah. We all have our own gifts. We do. It's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I write in the, in the book about jealousy of being jealous of others' gifts. And, and I write that, you know, if God had wanted you to have a gift, um, and if you had needed that gift to live your purpose, he would have given it to you. Mm-hmm. So move on. Appreciate the gift in someone else. Give thanks to God that he has given that person that gift. Mm-hmm. And then move on. If you don't have it, you don't have it. That's okay. That's okay. Mm-hmm. I agree. There are many gifts I do not have that I wish I did. <laughs> What's, one? What's one gift that you wish you had, Cynthia? Um, I wish that I had been able to, um, I, I am also a convert, and I wish I had converted earlier because I think I would have had uh, more impact on my theology students. Oh. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, I think. I think I was a decent teacher. I'm not saying I wasn't, but um, I think that living the faith a long time under different circumstances mm-hmm. uh, builds, uh, I don't know if I'd say it builds character, but it builds something within you that you can then give to people that you're not necessarily able to when you just start, you know. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> But that is, that is, um, but that's, there's nothing I can do about that. <laughs> no, you can't. So that's where I would say, move on. But I asked you, I, it, 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 I asked you what, what that yeah. was. I think I wish, I wish I could be, and this is actually something that I'm trying to develop. I wish I could be better about confrontation. I tend oh. to get really uncomfortable with confrontation. Um, and so I'm just now sort of, learning to trust a little bit more as I, as my prayer life has really developed in the last few years, I'm learning to trust in the Lord a lot more and mm-hmm. turn to him. And if I know he really wants me to say something, then to just have that trust that if it's spoken in love, um, 
then hopefully it will be received in love. And if not, I can't do anything about that. I'm just being obedient to him asking me to do something. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. That is, that is something that my husband's very direct and um, I'm less so Just put it that way. I'm not as passive aggressive as I used to be, but I'm, I'm definitely less direct than I used to be. Yeah. Actually my husband is much more direct than me. That could be a gender difference. Yeah, it could be. It definitely yeah. could be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But we need both. We need both. So do. Um, yeah. it's, it's, or, it's good to have both. Yeah. Um, or maybe, maybe not, the way we show it is different. Yes. Yes. I was just going to say, or maybe not. I mean, no one wants passive aggressive parents. No one wants, <laughs> wants to live with passive aggressive people. So I'm not saying we need passive aggressiveness. <laughs> Definitely not. But, um, that would be something I'm it differently. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah, it's, um, it's interesting how we all have to deal with these issues in one way or another. And I think a lot of times we don't even rationally think about them. We just react, you know? Yes. Intentionality, intentionality and thought, you know, mm-hmm. You mentioned the distractedness that we live with as a culture and oh yeah it the distractedness and, and the, the multitasking that we do both of those really prevent us from i think living the most fruitful lives mm-hmm. and they're actually harmful they are yeah um you know we are not meant to be you know rats on a on a wheel And I often, that image often goes through my mind as I'm doing this, 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 and this, you know, have the TV on. (laughs) (laughs) Too much. Yes. Yeah. The overstimulation. One of the, one of the practices that I've changed um, really since writing the book was having silence in the car when I can. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, with, Four kids, I drive around a lot. We go to soccer practices, back and forth and back and forth. Mm -hmm. And after the kids are dropped off someplace or if I'm on my way to pick them up and it's just me in the car, which it frequently is, it's just silence. Yeah. And I'll keep, um, I don't know if this is okay or not, but I keep a little notebook in the car too. So that in the silence, you know, I talk to the Lord and then we get to a red light, I'll I'll jot down. (laughs) I'll jot down little things that like, Oh, I got to take this to prayer. Just, just j- jot it down while I can't again, multitasking while driving. I mean, it's, I'm at a stoplight at least I have actually pulled over into side streets before to be like, Oh, I got to get this down. This is good. But it's mm-hmm. in the silence that we hear him. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's, 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 he's a God of, of peace. He's not a God of chaos. Right. Mm-hmm. Our Lord is. So I'll just drive in quiet. Or mm-hmm. I'll cook in quiet. I used to love to, to put on music. And now I just cook in the quiet. Um, when I do mindless tasks that are drudgery, though, I'm thinking laundry, yard work. I listen to podcasts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't do those in silence because it's just miserable. <laughs> Working yeah. out, I don't do that in silence because it's just miserable. But, but, but otherwise... You know, I try to cultivate as much silence as I can in the home. I want to go around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. I use, I often have something going in the car when I'm driving because I'm one of those people that can easily fall asleep. Oh, well, then you please listen to things when you're driving. I do, but I'm, I'm fussy about what I listen to, you know, because uh, there's a lot of garbage out there. There is. And unfortunately, we're just sort of continuing to feed ourselves garbage. And then we're surprised when we feel like garbage. Uh, garbage, it's- garbage out. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's sort of like watching a kid eat a bunch of Halloween candy on Halloween night. Mm-hmm. And then they get sick and they look at you like, what happened? I'm like, well, you just fed yourself a bunch of garbage, honey. That's, that's why, that's why you, you lost it all. That's why you feel horrible or the college kid that binge drinks and then wakes up with a hangover and feels horrible and is doing poorly in class. You're like, well, of course you feel horrible. Of 
course you're doing awful in class. Of course, this is not going well for you. You're consuming garbage. Yeah. It's the same with us as adults. And I don't think we really realized the garbage that's around us because we've, we've lowered our standards so much. And there's, there's such an overwhelming amount of things that instead of filtering through all the garbage to find the gems, we just consume the garbage. And then if we find a gem, we think, Oh, wow, this is really great. Yeah. Go back to the garbage. Yeah. Well, there is a lot of garbage. There's no question of that. And uh, I think sometimes people are so used to listening to it. Um, they don't realize it's garbage anymore. I, th- I, I definitely think that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've, we've, we've lost a lot of intentionality as a culture. Mm-hmm. We have lost a lot as a culture. <laughs> You know, I mean, I was born in 1950 and I, I, you know, I mean, I was a child in the 50s, so I don't remember everything, obviously, but I remember it being more quiet, Mm. um, less chaotic. um, And I think a lot of that is just because of the way the society has changed. Radio, television, CD players, you know, telephone um, you know, that cons- constant busyness. Mm-hmm. Well, we don't, we don't like to say no to anything. Mm-hmm. And so instead of, in, and this is hard as a parent because I, I don't want to only say no to my kids constantly. Mm-hmm. And we are busy. I, I, we certainly are. We're not as busy now that we've only got three at home. Um, now that my oldest is gone and, you know, my second oldest drives. And so it's, it's a lot less busy now than it was. But for a while, it, I was, I was that person just spinning plates or juggling balls or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. metaphor you want to use. That was me. But we don't want to say no to anything. And if they say, Hey, can I do gymnastics? We want to say yes. Hey, can I do piano lessons? We want to say yes. Hey, because we look at it and we say, it's not a bad thing. So right. let's say yes, because it's not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my daughter wanted to go out um, this afternoon and this evening. She had a half day, my 14 year old. And I was like, no, sorry. Um, she wants to go out tomorrow night to a Halloween party someplace. I said, no, sorry. Um, and she's actually okay with it. She's getting used to me saying no to things that aren't necessarily bad, but they're not the best it's Mm -hmm. it's not what she should be doing at that time and her response this morning when I was telling her no again because it was the second time she asked um she just wanted a little more explanation she wanted the why and I gave it to her and and her react her reaction was okay yeah that makes sense you know I think I probably should work on my essay anyhow Mm -hmm. yeah Instead of keeping her busy, 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 saying, yeah, you go out with friends. Yeah, you do this. Yeah, I'll break my back running you uptown, downtown, all around town. No, no, let's just have dinner as a family. Um, No, we don't need to say yes to everything. Right. Um, Sometimes people need permission to say no to things that are good things um, because it's maybe not the best use of their time. Mm -hmm. That's true. But with all the options, you know, you say no to one thing and something else pops up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you can have, if you can be really purposeful in what you're doing day to day, even moment to moment and living that intimacy with the Lord, then, then you're asking him, what should I do now? What should I say here? Should, Should I say yes? Should I say no? And those are the kind of conversations that, have really helped me not just Mm -hmm. in my parenting, but like in life Mm -hmm. that I really wish I had been having in my twenties and thirties. But I, I didn't start having them until Mm -hmm. really my Mm forties. Live and learn. Yes. 
we all mature, hopefully. Um, well, we do mature whether we want to or not. Um, and I think there is, you know, there is something about becoming more wise as you get older. Um, hopefully. Um, and that, I think, is what you're seeing in yourself, although you're still very young. Mm-hmm. And certainly something I think I see in myself. You know, you if you do a lot of stupid things when you're young, not bad things, but just stupid, you know, like not studying when you should or whatever, um, talking back to your parents, you know, driving too fast, which actually that one is bad. But, um, you know, it, take, it takes time for you to mature. Mm-hmm. And uh, hopefully most of us do and see a better, better way of living. Yeah, and I did do a lot of stupid things when I was younger. Oh, so did I. Yeah, I, I, I did. I have to sometimes remind myself that my children are not me. And just because I did dumb things when I was 19 doesn't mean that my 19-year-old is also doing dumb things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hopefully he's, he's learned a little bit from, from my um, journey. I won't say mm-hmm. errors necessarily, although they, there were a lot of errors there. But from mm-hmm. my journey to kind of be on a, on a different path. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll see though we'll see yes mm-hmm. well that's all very interesting you know we uh we've had quite an interesting conversation i think well thank you cynthia i enjoyed it i'm so glad i did too mm-hmm. i think that's been one of the fun things about writing this book is meeting new people Mm-hmm. And, and having conversations like this and um, they're not conversations that you usually have with a stranger. True. And, and there's something just very cool about being able to do that. So You're I right. really appreciate you, you having me as a guest. Oh, I enjoyed it very much. So, you know, it's, it's good. I like to, I like to learn what's behind people writing mm-hmm. because well, that makes sense given your interest in the, in, and in, in your own field with the memoirs and, and whatnot. I, that's, yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting to me. And of course, obviously I think if you're interviewing somebody and they're boring, you, should tell, you know, it's not going to go well. <laughs> I've actually never had that happen, but uh, good. Because some of your previous interviewees might be thinking, oh, is she talking about me? <laughs> no, um, but I've, I've actually, um, I've had over 200 interviews on this show now. Wow. Yeah, I consider wow. it my ministry. That's and, wonderful. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say the overwhelming majority of them, even if they didn't go really, really, really smooth, they were worth doing because there was something that would come out that I would say, Oh, this is important. Yeah. No. So, so yeah, over 200, I think it's something like 210 now. Mm. What was yeah. your most memorable interview? Mm. There were a lot of really memorable ones. Um, I've talked to, um, to people. It's a, it, there was one man, now I can't think of his name, but he had written about the Trinity. He had no training as a theologian, um, had not really, um, <clears throat> not really studied it. I mean, I'm sure he didn't read the Summa. Right. And he just got it through prayer and going to Mass. Mm-hmm. And I was there listening to, I teach Trinity. I was sitting there listening and it's like, Oh man, I'd love to have you in class because, you know, um, because he knew so much yeah. and it was really impressive to me. And it was like, this is someone I could hold up as an example of, you know, you, there's different ways of getting this. It's not just information. No. It's a class where you study something mm-hmm. an A on a grade because you manage to memorize it. Mm-hmm. That's all it is. It's nothing. It's, it's just some information. But this man had uh, had worked on his own studying and 
find right. the yeah. Lots of prayer, I'm sure. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that I think would probably be the the most memorable. Mm, that's a beautiful story. It is. It is. Yeah, and um, you know, I have. A, there's another man um, that I interview. He writes. I don't know how he writes as much as he does. Um, and he has written about the relationship between science and religion, which I'm very interested. Oh, yes. Yeah. And because, you know, when we're looking out there trying to figure out what's going on, you know, like the planets and things like we're doing now with the, you know, the spaceships that we send up and everything, mm-hmm. or whether you're doing it with a microscope looking at cells, what you're looking at is creation and seeing the order there. You are, you are, you're not making rules. You're finding the rules that God put into matter. Yeah. And it was, you know, so this, um, you know, this man is also, you know, just, he's a doctor, a PhD. And, um, I just listened to him and it's like, wow, you know. That's beautiful. I, I wrote a piece about uh, science and faith for spiritualdirection.com recently mm-hmm. a, 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 about the interplay and the importance of um, not discount science, not discounting faith and faith, not discounting science mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. that, that they do support each other. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, just look at what we know now about, it's, you know, galaxy after galaxy after galaxy. And it's like, God didn't just decide to make the earth and walk away. <laughs> you know, he made all of this or made it in such a way that, you know, that it would progress in a certain way. Yeah. And I mean, that fascinates me. You know, they had on the news the other night, the um, there's a galaxy that they call the star maker. Uh, and I looked at that and it was like, oh, God is really smart. <laughs> you know? It, but it's true, you know, like we're looking at what he did to make this happen. Mm-hmm. Oh, so we don't understand the rules. I mean, you can't walk away from that and say, oh, that's just science. That's, that's against religion. It's not. No. Although it can be used that way. But Beauty of wonder, just to be able to look with awe and wonder at the beauty of the what the Lord has created. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I had an experience once, which was um, bizarre. Um, you know, the uh, Magi saw the star. And and so I, I can't remember, I think it was two years ago. And um, I had heard that the scientists thought that there's um, a, the two planets, Jupiter, I think, and Saturn, um, they don't get close, close, but there's something about the way they're closer so that when we look at up at it at a particular time that happens like every few hundred years, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's they think that was actually the star that the Magi saw. I do remember that. And we yeah. all, when that came, when it came to the point where we could see it best in our mm-hmm. part, of the, part of the country, whatever, uh, we all went out that night to well, look we, at her. Yeah, we were out driving, and I said, tonight's the night, and I knew the time that it was supposed to start and everything, and it was a cloudy, rainy night. We oh. got to the front of the house. Mm-hmm. I got out of the car, and I looked up, and it was there, and I, so cool. I started to cry. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, it was such a gift. Mm. so i'm standing now we don't know that that's what the magi Mm -hmm. but it could have been and it was just that possibility that i was looking at the same thing that they had looked at over two thousand years ago yeah that led them to to the christ child yeah yeah cool yeah i mean it was it was such an emotional experience for me so my husband's everything what is wrong with you? <laughs> okay, again, that sounds like something my husband would say. <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> Look at the star. <laughs> anyway. Oh, so anyway, this I think has been a very uh, interesting interview. 
And if you do any more writing or another book, you know, get in touch. I'll get that parenting book, the real parenting book together. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll do it again. So. Wonderful. Well, if anyone wants my book, they're not going to find it on Amazon yet. Okay. Um, but they can get it from my website, maryruthhackett.com. Okay. So pretty easy. www.maryruthhackett.com. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a tab for the book, Daughter by Design, Discovering Your Identity as God's Beloved Daughter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I had to preempt you because someone told someone once that they could get it at a bookstore. And then I had to go find the bookstore <laughs> in Iowa and get them the books. because. <laughs> Don't tell them it's on Amazon or in any bookstores because it's not yet. <laughs> just my, just my, just my site. Unless you're in Iowa, and then you can go to Divine Treasures, where it happens to be in stock. Okay, okay, alrighty. Um, so this has been very enjoyable. Um, mm-hmm. it has. Yeah. Would you like to say a prayer to close us? Yes, let's close in prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together, for allowing us to carve out this time to share together. We thank you for this program and for those who work behind the scenes to make it possible. Holy Spirit, we invite you to continue to shower us with your grace and to help us to continue to grow in holiness. Mother Mary, Mediatrix of Grace, we just ask that you continue to pray for us long after we have fallen asleep or moved on to do our other duties. We ask all this uh, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mary Ruth, and uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to interview you again. I hope so. Thank you very much. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.